Okay, this is the audio review for Death is Theater, a dramaturgical analysis of the American funeral. Okay, so the performative nature of funeral directing. So funeral directors stage a performance so that the audience, in this case, the grieving family, will think that they are competent, sincere, and have respect and you know treat the, the dead person with respect and dignity. There are no second impressions possible, so they have to create a favorable impression as impressions are extremely important for a funeral director. Because when it comes to this business, choices for increasing the business are limited. You can't increase the amount of dead people. So you can either get more of your share of the business that's in your community, or you can merchandise up so that the average cost of a funeral rises. But otherwise, those are your only two choices. So when it comes to role distance, the sacred and the profane, there's amount of social distance that exists between funeral directors and their clients. And there's also a social distance between his work and the public, meaning death, and the public that they are performing for. So they deal with objects that are both sacred and profane. So there's often a separation, well, this is actually the most essential part, a separation of body work from directive work. So sometimes this entails, um, to separate these things, sometimes the director either wears different outfits for different roles or hires people to work exclusively as morticians in preparing the body for funeral. So directors are trying to separate themselves from, at least what they said in the reading, the loathsomeness. I think a, either, a better way would be, be kind of like icky, ugh, right? Of preparing a dead body for, for a burial. So in that way, there's a parallel to the medical profession because emotional detachment is desirable, right? Just like it is in the medical profession. If you had emotional attachment to someone, it's difficult to cut into their body to perform a necessary heart surgery, right? Um, which is why surgeons don't operate on people they know, <laughs> right? They operate on patients, not their families. So um, you have to be emotionally detached so that you can do that job. So in the preparation room, uh, they have to use detachment to embalm and prepare bodies because embalming is basically like draining the body of all blood and then filling with formaldehyde and other chemicals, um, which is kind of gross. So if you're emotionally attached to that person, embalming them, um, having to kind of like rub down their entire body, um, their nude body, can be very difficult to detach their humanity from, right? So you have to really be um, emotionally detached. So as far as the backstage regions, um, the preparation and the rehearsal, a successful funeral is one that's later seen by the griefing family as a respectful, appropriate tribute to the life and memory of the deceased. So this takes a lot of backstage work, and this is strategically hidden from the audience so that they can control the front stage image. So there's uh, a restaurant example they give that's a lot more palatable. Haha, <laughs> see what I did there? Anyway, where if you've worked in a restaurant in the back, you see what goes into preparing the food, so you never see restaurants the same. Kind of like um, I have cousins that are in the film industry where I don't think I'd want to do that because when you're in it, you see the behind the scenes so much that it kind of loses that social reality for you. When you see the film, but you know like, okay, well, that person's an actor and right after this scene, they decided to blah, blah, blah. It kind of takes away the, the fun, I guess. Um, so backstage is where you have all the equipment and props that you need to, to produce a performance. And the area is considered private. And the scenes that go on in it are protected from public view and enforced with barriers like doors, curtains, locks, or employees only signs. So the backstage setting in this context is the preparation room, sometimes called the medical laboratory, um, that's spatially separated from the funeral chapel and other regions uh, that the public go into inside the funeral home. Um, and this social and physical boundary is super important, right? Because when preparing a corpse, a dead person is washed, shaved, disinfected, sliced, pierced, drained of blood, creamed, powdered, waxed, stitched, and painted. Seeing this could change the front stage view of the dignity that that person's supposed to have. So the rhetoric of backstage regions, this reverence for bodies, it's part of the front stage performance, 
But the morticians themselves, because they have to distance, because they have to have that emotional detachment, morticians see the body as an object. The examples that they gave uh, <laughs> were calling bodies floaters, right? People that were caught uh, or that were that died um, in water or referring to a burn victim as Mr. Crispy, right? So they referred to corpses as, you know, oh, this one's a fresh one or this one's a warm one or a cold one. And even the way caskets were referred to is very different. Like, uh, oh, put him in the tin can or things like that instead of, you know, the kind of reverent way that it would happen in the front stage performance. So this is really just role distancing behavior. It's a way to understand the separation because there's an alienation in the job of mortician so in this way, they can convey the atmosphere that it's just any other kind of job. So role distancing uh, behavior can be seen in the jokes or, you know, that they tell each other while they're preparing the body or, um, you know, singing or doing activities like that while preparing a body for burial. So front stage performance is uh, the bringing off the show. So, um, you know, the, the changing of title from undertaker to funeral director is pretty apt as they are directing they're controlling a dramatic production and this includes continuing backstage functions during the service because you're going to have you know drivers pallbearers ministers musicians all these other people too that need to be orchestrated so that the funeral is uninterrupted and you know proceeds smoothly so this involves a lot of controlling the situation so back to that play analogy it's like a cast of characters so the director of the play is obviously the funeral director. The deceased is the star of the show. The supporting cast is the grieving family. So you would think that the family isn't on stage, but they are on stage at a funeral because other attendees are going to judge how well the family held up emotionally at the funeral. So emotion is judged. If you show too little of it when you are close to the person that's dead, that scene is negative. When you show way too much of it for someone that you weren't that close to, that's also seen as negative. So, you know, there has to be the right amount of emotion performed. And the minister also has an important role, right? They establish that the body is a shell and that the soul of the person that was once inside has now departed. So, you know, continuing the analogy, uh, the funeral home is the theater and stage. The funeral home itself tends to be decorated in traditional decor not modern design, not like dark and gothic, right? But typically gray or blue. And the stage itself in the funeral chapel, um, it's interesting, the funeral chapel itself is pretty much set up like a theater, right? You kind of have a stage that is the focal point of viewing. You have um, like an audience with, you know, um, rows of chairs and, you know, walkways down aisles and things of that nature. Um, so... You also have passages from backstage to front that ensure that the front stage performance is not affected by the actions that are going on backstage. So when it comes to props and background, the scene is pretty neutral usually, so it can be customized to the dead person. So they'll use their pictures and religious symbols, stuff like that. If the background is successfully arranged, then the funeral director can control the definition of the situation as a respectful, somber tribute to the dead person, right? So establishing the mood is a huge part of this. Um, this is typically done with a careful choice of music, usually in consultation with the family. So the music with um, a program, like a printed out program that people pick up as they walk in the door, this can provide cues for people so that they know what's about to happen. Like, okay, this music started, so now um, this person's done talking, it's going to be a prayer or now this person's gonna come up and give the eulogy or something like that, right? It gives you a idea of how it's proceeding and what gives cues to them as to how they're supposed to act or what they're supposed to expect to happen next. So the front stage rhetoric and the denial of death, this is an interesting aspect that I'm gonna kinda of leave it off on even though he goes on a little bit after this, but this is where I'm leaving it. Um, that while the funeral is about accepting death, it conversely is often filled with rhetoric that avoids death as finite or final, right? So they'll see the person as, oh, they, they're at rest now, right? Or they have eternal sleep or they're alive in another world. 
And this largely comes from the religious aspect of promising an afterlife for a lot of religious beliefs that is woven into the grieving process and the understanding of what happened. So it's kind of ironic as, you know, some people argue that the importance of the funeral is acknowledging that this person is dead and an important part of the grieving process is acceptance of what's happening so that you can then grieve. Um, but conversely, ironically, the rhetoric of the funeral itself is really more of this, oh, they've, they're in a better place now kind of thing, um, which again, doesn't confront the reality of death being final. <laughs>